welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. Well, hi, Laura. It's so, so good to be talking with you again. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you for having me on your show. It's wonderful to be here. It's yeah. good to have you. So Laura and I first <laughs> connected because I guested on her podcast, which is fantastic. If you haven't checked it out, Ready for Polyamory is awesome. Great resource. As well as your thank very you. entertaining Instagram. <laughs> You keep a nice, you keep a nice beat on the Instagram. I mean, I try, I try to mix it up between like, look, today is educational. Tomorrow is something dumb we said on Twitter, but <laughs> I see, I think that's just the right pace. I really do. So Laura, would you just open us up by telling us a little bit about your background? Um, obviously with the title ready for polyamory, you, I think the audience can get a clue about where we might be heading, but Tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, well, so I've been in polyamorous relationships for about 15 years. My educational background is actually in uh, law, but I don't practice law. I work as a relationship coach and also uh, I wrote the book Ready for Polyamory and I have a bunch of social media feeds sort of related to that and a blog that updates once or twice a week we've got about 250 posts up since 2020 on there um and yeah uh it's all about sort of figuring out what flavor of non-monogamy might be appropriate for you and whether polyamory is that and if so then kind of how to find other people who are practicing that in a compatible way to you because not everyone's notion of what polyamory is, is the same. And when folks enter that world, it can be really confusing to sort of kid in the candy store moment of like, I can do anything. Oh, that is a good moment. Yeah. Except OMG like, with I, what happens. I, yeah. <laughs> right. 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 There's that moment of like, I can do anything, but not everyone is doing the same thing as me. Oh, no or using the same words to describe it, you must run into this all the time. I think you and I bonded about words before. Yes, I mean, I think my most popular, the most popular posts on my site are the ones describing what particular terms mean. Um, because like the first class I ever taught on polyamory before I had a blog, before I did whatever, was teaching a seminar at a local kink space about what is kitchen table polyamory because sure. people use that term to mean so many different things. Um, and about five years ago, I taught a class called Beyond the Kitchen Table that was about kitchen table polyamory and parallel polyamory. That was like the first class I ever ran about how people use this term to mean everything from like you all live together and plan all your finances together and whatever to, oh, we have a board game night once a month. Right. Yeah. Those aren't really the same thing, but I could, I see that phrase on dating oh, sites yeah. all the time, like looking for kitchen table poly. I'm like, wow, I'm going to need you to get more specific. More, yeah. What does that, right. what would that version of polyamory look like for you? And exactly. have you noticed yourself that you fall into any particular label that actually fits well or do you flow between them well so my polycule likes the kind of newish term that's gaining steam which is garden party polyamory which is that middle ground between kitchen table and parallel where like we're willing to get together for birthdays and important events and whatever but we don't spend all of our social time together and I'm not going to move in with my partner and his nesting partners. But on an individual level, I identify as a relationship anarchist. So what are my other relationships going to look like on a given day? Hard to say, right? What they look like now is not what they're likely to look like in six months or a year. Okay. So I'm so glad you're here because first off, those were great descriptions. 
garden party polyamory, loving that one. term so much. Um, also relationship anarchy. Ken and I haven't spoken about this very much. Um, I have always had a, a, a little trouble with that term because I related, I learned about anarchy in my philosophy classes. And so mm -hmm. I've struggled with it. Cause I'm like, Ooh, I, I think of it a little, a little bit the same way I struggle with yoga. Cause I'm like, Ooh, once you know what yoga is in India and in Southeast Asia, it's really hard to decontextualize it. So I haven't learned yet how to really understand, even though I have read the relationship anarchy manifesto, I don't totally grasp it in my heart. So I'd love to hear you share why relationship anarchy feels right for you. Well, I actually wanted to step back and what is relationship <laughs> anarchy for you? Because that was the question that came up to me since we were talking about words. Right. So relationship anarchy is an underlying philosophy of how you engage in relationships that dismantles the hierarchy among interpersonal relationships and says that like friendships aren't any less valuable than your distinguished romantic relationships or your distinguished sexual relationships and that all of them kind of exist on a plane and you customize your commitments with each individual human who you relate to right so it can say that or it allows you to make the choice to for example decide that you're entering into a platonic life partnership with someone to co-parent and simultaneously have romantic partnerships elsewhere and have those be on an equal footing for you emotionally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so I find that as the thing that's appealing for me about it is that it's extremely flexible mm. and that it allows me as someone who really sees my kind of duties as a parent as my primary partnership mm -hmm. and any relationships I have with adults as sort of secondary to that to place all of those on an equal footing in a way that feels really organic and appropriate to my life at this stage of my life. Maybe mm -hmm. later I'll identify differently. Three years ago, I identified as a hierarchical polyamorist who was living with one of my partners and not with any of the others. And that was a whole different ball game. Right. This is a wonderful distinction, I think, for us, yeah. because um, Ken and I do live in a hierarchical polyamory. And I think um, it's been challenging to talk about it to some degree because there can be a little bit of pitting against each other as if these things mm -hmm. can't mutually coexist. But in my experience, all of these different ways to do open relating can coexist if we have the conversations. Like that's the whole if, premise. Yeah. If yeah. we talk about them, because one of the reasons we are um, labeled the way we are is because of our commitment to our kids. We both committed to raising the blended family we have as siblings together, even if we split romantically. So mm -hmm. I really resonate with you talking about, yep, my commitment to the kids is first. And so putting friendships and all of the other relationships you have in an equal stance, I can also imagine this gives you great flexibility to create a world for your children that you really want. Well, right, exactly. It lets me and my co-parents who I'm not romantically involved with the one of my co-parents who I was romantically involved with when we had the children any longer and my ex metamor who like, we're all perfectly friendly. We co-parent well, but we reside in two houses now, but it gives us the flexibility to go, okay, over this number of years, if someone gets involved in the children's lives logistically to a certain point, we can negotiate what that looks like in terms of allowing them say in parenting decisions, what that does or doesn't look like, right? And now at a time when we're living in such a kind of legally fraught situation, oh yeah, we're, I live in a state that's really good for this. Connecticut is like a very safe place to be. We have new parentage laws that came into effect recently that mean that like we're in the process of figuring out um, what's it called? How to get me and my co-parent who is the we're each the biological mother of one of our two children mm. on the opposite child's birth certificate. Yeah, like second and that was recently adoption. allowed by new yeah. state law. It's so they rewrote the set of rules in such a way that like their dad doesn't have to give up any rights for all three of us to now be on their birth certificates. Yes. And that's great. And that's a process that we're working through. 
but we're in this super liberal state that's suddenly allowing this if the continued backslide of some legal things happens oh yeah yeah it's going to be a whole different ball game and so we've talked out a lot of these scenarios where what happens if these things happen what village are we going to be relying on in terms of our other partners and our support network and how do we keep that flexible but stable for the kids as we move forward how long do we wait to introduce people how do we phase people out slowly how do we engage each other as supports if a breakup is ugly to help with keeping partners in kids lives so it's not a sudden breach oh. things like that oh my heart is melting a little bit because i think some of my own um deepest uh pains and i would i think i would even go so far as to say regrets uh, in my own polyamorous experience have been around not having i didn't when I started 13 years ago, I didn't know what I didn't know. And my kids are much older. So they were already established humans. And I didn't prepare for those realities. The reality yeah. is, if you're going to have flexible relationships, then the likelihood is some things will change. And we didn't make those plans. And some of my children's complaints are that people left and they would just disappear. And because we were following this very monogamous paradigm, in fact, it made it feel like, oh, well, that must be the only thing to do. Since two people split, you just, you, then you just split and you don't see each other anymore. But when mm -hmm. there are children involved, it's more complicated. I'm loving how thoughtful this is and, and collaborative so that you can meet the needs of the situation. Even if in some cases it might be, oh, this really will be abrupt. So what do we do about that abruptness? Well, right, exactly. We have like backup plans in place where if this is abrupt and like I personally can't be in the same space, as, I have a partner of six and a half years, right? If something were to happen that I can't foresee right now, but like say there's some horrible betrayal and we break up, my co-parents have said like, we'll make sure the kids keep saying his name is also Ken, Ken <laughs> <laughs> occasionally so that that way it's not like he disappears out of their lives all of a sudden they can still see him they can still see his kids we will make sure there are still play dates for a certain amount of time and just space them out to a greater and greater degree and let that peter out because they've known him their whole lives basically as long as they remember right right and there's you're touching on something so important that de-escalation like yeah. you know i don't think there's a lot of talk about it no. um in the general world, but you've witnessed it, like the the, the abruptness versus the de-escalation. Yeah. You've witnessed it as a person. I, I've had a bunch of abrupt losses and just dealing with adults around that is hard enough. That's hard enough. I let have, alone. I have, oh yeah, it's so hard. I, I honor the conversations that you have and the, that you bring this up. Um, like she said, we didn't know, we didn't know. So there were many conversations that didn't happen that should actually have been um like prerequisites without that conversation nothing should have gone forward we we missed a few of those opportunities and a lot of trouble came from it do you have is there a method any sort of like organized way that you have these conversations or do they happen organic organically well so i don't want to make it sound like we're also like enlightened beings or something is that we've seen our friends have these ugly breakups where then the kids had suffering as a result or like, you know, our partners and metas had breakups and then it was their kids were having these negative adverse reactions and we went, oh, let's talk about what our plan is <laughs> yeah, good. For when we have these situations because we want the backup plan ahead of time before we're the parents handling the kid who's upset that the other parent's partner is now gone oh, right? Learn like, from experience. <laughs> yeah. right so we learned from other people's experiences so that we didn't have to learn from our own luckily in this case um but i think generally what we've tried to do when we're having these sort of preemptive conversations is we do uh check-ins with a family therapist now that we don't live in the same place yeah once a month and so we try to incorporate anything new that we think of that's in this sort of family of hey just preventatively this person is becoming more important 
can we start incorporating them in plans or thinking about these things with regard to them? We also bring up things like this person's becoming more important to me are like, I'm thinking of bringing them around the kids. I want you to know in advance for when they come to your house, talking about them kind of conversations, right? Even when we all lived in the same place, I tried to suggest that we date with a culture of polyamorous parents should date like divorced parents Mm -hmm. in terms of speed of introducing children to partners and things like this. And I know that that's not feasible for everyone. Like you just can't always make that work in terms of timing and convenience of childcare and things like this. But we were very lucky that when we all resided together as a V, it was quite possible for one of the three of us to usually be at home with the kids while the others were dating. Right. You know, I, I, that makes me think of the, um, the interesting situation when, when we talk about introducing. I've always found that there are these beautiful casual moments. I have met girlfriends, mm-hmm. part, children in these very casual ways where just like any other neighborhood person would come around mm-hmm. and hang out by a fire. And I think people often forget about taking those opportunities to just be platonic with your new, new ish partners acting in a platonic way to allow for that space so that, so that you're both getting to see and witness your partner in their whole life, but also allowing the children to not have to incorporate a whole schema, not having to, like, they don't have to bite off more than they need to chew. Well, right. And not having to do the whole this is mom's girlfriend moment when you're not sure where the relationship is yet. Right. Because I know, I don't know if people are a lot like me, but I am a very in my head, very slow to become vulnerable with humans person. And so a lot of my relationships, people are probably, I'm probably ready to introduce them to the kids before I'm ready to be fully vulnerable and like label a relationship. Right which is bizarre yeah. given that I've just explained that I go slow, <laughs> but like, you know, we're like three months in and I'm like, you are a perfectly safe human and I'm beginning to trust you. If you also have kids, why don't we take all of them to the playground? That's a nice neutral, right. everybody can have a nice time kind of daytime thing. And look, this is mom's friend and mom's friend's kids. Let's have a nice afternoon. And we don't have to put a label on it yet. Yeah. Right. And I'll do that before we get to a, I'm dating this person. They're going to be here overnight while you're here. Right. Kind of event. Yeah. And we're on such the other end of the spectrum. So our kids are now um, 15 to 22. So, oh, so it's a big point, introduction. Literally. Yeah. It's just like Man, we whoever. We can't get them to the playground anymore. No, <laughs> no they won't go. No, won't absolutely go. not. So yeah. it's, it's actually really fun for me now because I can just casually drop in like, oh, I'm heading out on a date. And they're like, have fun. And it's it's the other side of, of that. But, but it only happens this way because we've normalized the concept of intimacy across multiple dimensions. And I would love to hear what it's like for you, you, because you, so 15 years in your children are obviously still small. So your children have grown up in this paradigm the whole, the whole time we had to introduce it to our older kids. Um, Mm -hmm. What is, what are some of the big challenges that you have come up against? Honestly, other parents are more of a challenge than any other situation. Like doctor's offices, great. I mean, I think we had like one nurse be slightly weird once about the fact that we have three parents listed in our kids' files and that was it. Um, Schools, mostly perfectly fine. We had one like remarkably rude administrator, but I couldn't tell if she was remarkably rude because we were slightly poorer than average for the district or because there were three of us. It was unclear which. Like, was it because I drove a beat up Honda or because there were three of us? Who knows? Um, You know, it's Connecticut. It's hard. Yeah, um, we're in Massachusetts. I totally get that. It could also just be a universally rude yeah. administrator. Right. <laughs> That's a thing. Yeah, a... you know, like she just wasn't a nice lady. Mm-hmm. Um, but then other parents are where you get the like, we've gotten a much better reaction from other parents now that I live in another house than mm-hmm. when all three of us were living in one place. 
people there was a lot a more of like response to that don't they yeah yeah just so many people being like wait so does he have a harem or are you going to be stealing my man at soccer practice? Oh, or I got that so the much. Who's the hmm? Yep. Mm-hmm. It was all very like a lot of very judgy parents and kids who totally got it, right? Like my kids went to two different preschools. One of them was a typical peer in a public pe- preschool program for special ed kids. Mm-hmm. So he was one of the like typical peer model kids and his school did all of the normal like who's in your family activities and he would name all of us and draw all of us and whatever and in that class there were kids with literally every family structure you can sort of imagine in that class of 20 kids so uh one parent of each gender families like not together but like single parents of each gender sort of typical mom and dad families um step parent families there was at least one with remarried step parents and there was us throughout that class and so his teacher just acted like it was perfectly normal so did all of the other little kids the other little kids called me at the time i dyed my hair bright red uh and i was edward's red-haired mom and then his other mom was edward's yellow-haired mom and that was it so simple (laughs) kids keep it simple kids don't care right and like his two best friends learned our names and shouted our names at us and that was fine and the other kids were like edward's red-haired mom (laughs) cool yeah simple done and then did you experience any um i mean there's i don't think there's another thing to call it discrimination um any challenges around those parents the the parents i mean there was always a little bit of like sort of back chat and like sideways rudeness but nothing more than that some of the parents were perfectly friendly and great and whatever and some of them were kind of rude and negative and we were in like the one red town in a blue area which doesn't help yeah same look it it's the town where my ex's parents had a house that we could rent for them from them at a discount. So like, so you do it. So you just do it. So we did it, but yeah. Yeah. Um, is it the town I would have picked otherwise? No, I'm not there now, but anyway, that being what it was, it wasn't really that bad. And my partner who lives in a triad, a couple towns over has had literally no problems with anyone and got asked to run for public office in town, living openly in a triad. Like, well, I didn't take them up on it because his actual job was too demanding for what they wanted him to do. But like, this is the thing about having these conversations. Once I started talking about this publicly, I realized that a lot more of the people who had been sort of quietly back chattering they actually just had a lot of curiosity. They It came out in some ways that were sort of sideways and didn't feel great, but they mostly were just mm-hmm. curious. How could that possibly work? And you're not gonna steal my husband. And I'm like, no more so than anybody could, right? Like, don't <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's not how the world works. Right. Um, it's, it, but, they, but there were questions. And I think the, uh, the general consensus before we started publicly talking was, oh, you don't ask those questions. So as yeah. soon as we started publicly talking about it, the questions died away and the attitude chilled out too, even in our very red town, because people realized, oh, well, if we have a question, we'll ask it. So I think there is something beautiful to that, but it did require a certain thing that I was very comfortable with, but um, not everybody in our first triad, not everybody was, um, and that was to be out. I was comfortable being out and I was prepared and I've stood on a TEDx stage and outed myself. So like the ship sailed for me. I, I was, but I, I wonder what you think about being polyamorous, being a parent and being polyamorous. Like, does it require you in a, to a certain degree to be out? It, it's complex. It's complicated. I know, but I think it depends on how you're intending to practice your polyamory. Mm. 
because if you're already an established parent who's parenting in a dyad or who's a single parent separated from someone who is not going to be engaging in polyamory with you, yeah. then you may need to not be out. Right. Right. Especially if you're a single parent who your co-parent is not polyamorous and wouldn't be accepting because yeah. the only real cases of legal action being taken against polyamorous parents are done by the other parent of the child or grandparents like the immediate parents of that person acting maliciously through the legal system right and that is actually where we found ourselves and um it is challenging to just live with that reality so i want to just say shout out to the listeners who are are afraid that that this might not work for them that you might not be able to be out like it's okay to not be out it's there's no requirement that goes for all your your um lgbtqia all of it right. you don't have to be out that is your decision to make and even if you're out in some areas it's okay to not be out in all areas and to do some protective stuff and right. yeah my heart goes out to you because i'm glad i get to be out now but it was and scary for most relationships or for most people entering into relationships they're perfectly happy to be part way out with you right if it's okay so long as you're out socially to a subset of your friends and i'm not really an affair that you only see in hotels yeah on every second thursday right yep that's it they don't mind it's that feeling it's i call it the concubine feeling yeah, I was, I literally was in that position at once and it was, I, it creeps up on you. So if you are being mm -hmm. in that spot where you're like, I'm, I feel hidden, that can be psychologically really challenging. I would encourage anyone in that position to make sure that they have a, a, <laughs> a non-monogamy trained therapist or coach yeah. to go to, to really hold space mm -hmm. for what that is like not just anyone because it's such a complex place to be um yeah but i love what you're saying about being partially out having a circle of people that you can be witnessed by because there is something special about being witnessed by our friends in our love in our relating right yeah right and if it's something where like it's a particular subset of your social circle it's friends who you made through having been non-monogamous who share a particular hobby or whatever, or, oh, well, we're theater people and all the community theater people know that we're out, but we don't tell everyone in the world, right? Yeah. Something totally. as simple as that can be big enough to make someone feel seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so my thing was for the first seven years that I was polyamorous, I wasn't out to family. I was out to friends. I was out. I was actually pretty far out to almost everyone. I just lived in a different country than my family, hadn't introduced my parents to anyone that I was dating except the man that I was about to marry, and was like, eh, there's no real reason to. Sure. That makes sense. And so I didn't. Yeah. Right? At the time, it just didn't matter. Yeah. And this was just long enough ago that, like, sort of social media was a different landscape than it is now. And so the ways that you shared things on social media were a little different and the level of that making a relationship feel real for people in scare quotes uh was less of a thing yeah and so it really just didn't feel like it mattered and then all of a sudden i was in this second relationship that was getting relatively serious and i was pregnant there you go yeah. so your family was building like... was no longer typical right and it was like well okay we're figuring out what we're gonna do about this unexpected pregnancy mm -hmm. because we didn't time any of this i was starting law school i was pregnant oh those are two easy things no problem <laughs> That's fine. way right, to go you you know, <laughs> you know it, i am the tiny percentage of people who have an iud failure so i'm sitting there like okay i had a massive birth control failure it's the second week of law school my husband is freaking out because he didn't really want to have kids. And our conversation on that had been, well, we'll cross that bridge in three years. 
So that was not a great place to be. So we were sitting there going, what do we do? And my new partner who I'd been getting closer with over the summer was like, look, no matter what you decide, I'm still here for this ride. Okay. And so I was like, well, I guess we've got to introduce you to my parents because you're part of all of this decision-making we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So you really had the full catastrophe. Oh, so I like came out under fire. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then my ex-husband decided he didn't want a parent and left. Yeah. And my partner's uh, girlfriend decided that she was going to family build with us. And like, it turned out really well, but was it at all what I would have anticipated a year prior? No. Right. Wow. That and goodness. was all of it super blamed by my family on you were polyamorous and that's why all of this happened? Yes. But like, do they have the greatest grandchildren and therefore it doesn't matter anymore uh, now? Yes. Yeah. Also. Right. 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 Yeah. Things can be messy and awesome at the same time. Being polyamorous right. in a law school. Yeah. But I, I get that. So, okay. So your partner's girlfriend signed up for the, the, the family. Right. Family exactly. Building. Signed up for the whole thing. And so that's how now i have an ex meta who is a co-parent with me because she's also the mother of my daughter who was our second child so like i had my son then and then two years later we were like we'd like to have another kid and she was like well i'd like to have this one if that's okay and i was like great i'm epileptic that was a complicated pregnancy we can have a less complicated one that sounds awesome nice (laughs) oh i love this This, this, this This is that collaborative family yeah. building that makes so much sense that, but it strains the imagination if you're inside the monogamous mindset, the bubble of the mindset, right. not it, like it's, oh, how I was a very happy pregnant person. Like I breastfed for 11 years straight. I had, you know, over multiple pregnancies and yeah, seriously, like they never believe me when I go for my mammograms, they're like, how many months? I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. And it went on and on. Mm-hmm. And I loved that. Like I could have had babies for everyone just perfectly happy, but I, I mean, I didn't need to raise, raise children for everyone. <laughs> That's a different, a different thing, but I love yeah. that. And I never, I never would have thought about it while I was in my monogamous paradigm while I was in there. It never occurred to me that in fact, one of my superpowers is being an easeful pregnant chick. Like it was just very easy Mm -hmm. and that could have been. And I love that you were able to to do that collaboratively. And so you have this creative family that even now I'm hearing like there are separations, there's changes, you live separately. But you also, there was something else in there because also there was an unplanned pregnancy in there. And something I hear all the time is, and it, it came up in our early relationship. Yeah. In fact, he was told by his primary partner at the time to get a vasectomy before mm-hmm. we had any um, intimate connection. Um, unplanned pregnancy is one of the big fears, I think, in, yeah. in polyamory. So what are you seeing about this now? Like, what do you see in your practice, in your coaching practice? How are people dealing with it? So it's one of the things that people bring up as one of their biggest fears in coaching every time, like, especially people who are still family building, but have a very fixed notion of what they want their family to look like. And it's one of those things where you only have so much control over your actions, right? So you can make all the agreements you want, take all the preventative step steps appropriately, right? You use the birth control with the partners who you're trying not to get pregnant and whatnot. But there is always the possibility that something happens and you need to take on or acknowledge that you're taking on that risk when you do so. Right. You need to have the frank conversation about what happens if this goes wrong. Right. Because really, especially in the world we live in now, you don't get to just sort of say well we can make this go away right you know it doesn't go the way we want right things are getting even more complicated which i can't believe that's where we are but here we are i mean it's the 
and we're in this horrible place where we literally had a senator this week suggest that we make birth control only available to married people, in which case we're all getting married for birth control, right. just so you guys know. Yes. Yeah. But just like, like, yeah. yeah just by I'm, the way, we'll be. I am a, like. <laughs> I've been for years resharing that post that's um, they've been shouting row and whispering with Griswold. Yes. And it's just, it's true. It's sad and true, right? Exactly. So exactly. since that's unfortunately where that faction of politics is at, the rest of us have to make our decisions with some forward planning in mind. Right. And we have to do things like those of us who have uteruses and don't want to be pregnant if we are already done having children need to if it's at all covered by our insurance get our fallopian tubes taken out do those yeah. steps do those steps. right that's a simpler surgery than some of the other ones that are available yeah. quicker recovery whatever if we're not done get iud's because they're longer lasting that's my choice just, frankly have those conversations Right. And then, and have those conversations in, a, in an updating. I, for, sometimes I, um, I forget that people don't think about the fact that it is an ongoing conversation. Um, and I have to remind myself as a sex educator, I have to remind myself that some of the people in my, that I come into contact with who struggle the most with their, with their understanding and knowledge about what sex education and what their own education needs to look like is mm -hmm. constantly updating. So what happens is I wind up with people over the age of 45, 50, thinking that they're done with that part of things. Like yeah. just thinking like, oh, well, you know, it's, and it, it'll be oh. easy and simple. And so they stop being really noting, like really taking account of their cycles and taking account of where they, um, how their birth control is working for them, whether it's still working for them. They start mm -hmm. taking for granted that how it's worked will keep working, even though we know things change. And right, then, even though there's big hormonal shifts then, right? Yeah, I want to yeah. like mail out to everyone a copy of Heather Corinna's book, the, um, what fresh hell is this? <laughs> what fresh is hell what is this? Yes. It's like, I just want to mail that out to the people in the appropriate age range. And yes. be like, if you're over, if you're over enjoy. 37, just, just, just buy it because you got to pregame that you got to just get mm -hmm. right into it. I'm 45 and I'm like, right. Just I'm in it. it. Just We're in it. it. Just read it, yeah. take it in. And if you are a penis owner and and you are having any sex that could have a pregnancy outcome, take seriously that that is the conversation you need to be involved yeah, in with every and, with every partner and and then to revisit and you got to take responsibility right. for that. And that if you personally don't want to be a parent, just get a vasectomy. Just do it. It's, yes. I understand that there are stupid memes that talk about how reversible they are. They're not easily They're not. reversible. It's yeah. extremely yeah. expensive to reverse them. It is possible. I know it's possible because my uncle had his reversed to have my fourth of my cousins, but like it's expensive. It's not reliable. It's not worth it. Yeah. But if you're done. Then be done. done. Right. Yeah. Totally. And, and take responsibility for communicating about this. I think there's a, there's a, there's a weird thing around um, what I notice is around Gen X. Like it, it, I'm noticing that my cohort, it's like, we think we're done talking about this. So let me just mm -hmm. say, we're not, we're not done. We have to keep talking about this. We have to keep wearing condoms. We have to keep doing all the things because we also have to do STI protection and conversations and all of this. And that's a part of having any relationship, let alone multiple relationships. Yeah. And the younger end of Gen X is actually really better about wearing condoms than yeah. the mid to young end of millennials because you were all just old enough when AIDS, AIDS. was a crisis yep, that you actually it. remember yep. but that said millennial men condoms are not that bad and if you complain about them one more time no one will ever fuck you again so stop yeah. it yeah stop it i just, just stop it. i just just stop it yeah it's just a um, condom it's it's okay we love we love you when you wear them we love this we love this about you do right it. exactly just do it um that said people who are choosing not to use them please find out about prep find out about your options from doctors especially if you have multiple partners especially if somewhere in your network there is someone who has hiv 
right sexual health or if you don't know because like right. there are people who have lots of anonymous sex or right. who really enjoy having anonymous sex and they may be somewhere in your extended network totally if you choose to only know one layer out in your network <laughs> Mm. understand that that's a risky position to be taking on that front on behalf like, of your whole polycule uh, like right. that's a risky yeah. like and and that risk the conversations on the other side of it are way harder than the conversations before stuff happens the conversations on the other side of an illness yeah. or an infection they're, they're way harder and right. and like look i am a big slutty slut I enjoy having lots of sex with lots of people. Yep. I use protection. I get tested regularly. I follow up with my partners about what it is that I am doing and when. Yeah. Because there is no other way to do that responsibly. Right. Yeah, yeah this is what there is. This is what there I'm is. Like, I am not the person in my polycule who has ever brought back an infection and the person who did got jokingly called a chlamydiate for the next six months because that's what you do. <laughs> Oopsies. And it I, that is not actually what you do, listeners, just yeah. so you know. You don't <laughs> need to be mean unless you're all in Gen X and then like uh, roasting each other is life. Now, wh what is that about us? What is that? But I, I really appreciate the frank conversation. We don't, we don't talk about that part of sex ed that often and one of the things the unsung hero of that is it's an intimacy builder yeah. you have those conversations you build trust you build resilience you build reliability so having those conversations can absolutely level up how the relationship feels and that is my reason for having them that is like that's my driver my motivation and if they're hard to have can I suggest having them while sitting next to each other, but not facing yes. each other on the bed? Yep. Sit next to each other, hold hands, don't face each other, face forward on the bed because you're in physical proximity, but you're not doing the like eye contact while talking about something that you're uncomfortable with. Right. And then as you gain comfort, change your posture. Right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're, we have another episode coming out very soon about the stigma of STIs and letting go of, of the stigma. It's, it's a thing. It's like getting a cold. They do happen. And then we move on. We make our roasts and we move on. Yeah. And <laughs> sorry for turning this into a giant STI conversation spun oh, off of the idea of parenting, to... but it's just in a way pregnancy is like the most common STI. Right. And so... <laughs> I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> The sexual health conversation just got a lot more complicated. I mean, it's mm -hmm. been this complicated the whole time, but now we're facing the there's removal urgency. of- well, There's urgency, exactly. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And you know, if you don't want a parasite on board, then um, it's okay. I, like, I, don't, I am not, uh, that's fine. That's totally fine. But for those who are mm -hmm. polyamorous and parenting and doing the family building, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it's, I don't think it's ever anything other than complex. It's always complex. We came to each other with children and that family building is complex too. It's, it's not like it's simple. I'm wondering as we, as we wrap up, what do you wish people knew about parenting as a polyamorous person? I mean, I think most of all, I wish people just kind of got that it's all of the same conversations and phases and stages as doing this monogamously with the one added layer of sometimes there are more adults there to love your kids. Talk about an advantage. Just a little extra support a little extra love somebody extra to like bring a an ice cream or a whatever on a bad day yeah yeah the the under the the under uh talked about aspect of building creative complex families is that there are more adults that's actually why we got into it in the beginning we both had a bunch of kids. He had three. I had four, and we wanted mm -hmm. um, we wanted a 
bigger community, a real like integrated family, not just not just playdates, but yeah. all of that building that, a village, building the village relationships. Yeah. yeah, and that was also the thing that got the most blowback. People were shocked that we would want the people would speak the word step parent in the most heinous way like oh but they'll be step parents i'm yeah. like you're missing the point i want more love i want more people in their lives it the label doesn't matter to me if they're willing to show up for my children that's what i yeah. want people i think it's partly because it's not just anti-monogamous to want that it's anti-capitalist mm. right yeah. there's mm. a lot invested in this idea of us being in nuclear families and individual homes and in having to hire babysitters and hire help and sort and of siphon that off and, into yep. individual spaces right. and so really building a village where like my partner who majored in english can help my kids with their homework yeah. and my co-parent who was an engineer can help them with math and can help my partner's kids while they're figuring out algebra for the first time. Yeah. Like that's not what's expected there. Right. I totally say that 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 was my second reason. I just needed to make sure that I kept an IT guy in my circle and somebody who could do math because I was a mm -hmm. homeschooler and I was like I'm going to max out around ninth grade. I'm going to need mm -hmm. to get me a math nerd. And and so I did and it's great. I like to keep yep. also somebody who can install printers whatever that is. I just need somebody around for that. And I cook. I, I am excellent. We, I love that concept of building the village. And I know I it, do. it sounds trite, but I'm hearing your, I hear your story and I, and I think, right. And you've chosen to live on your own right now. And yet the village is intact, the village of people, because the people are anchored around the children and the world you're creating for them. And that's, it's really beautiful, Laura. It really is. Yeah. And I mean, I have friends who they sort of similarly to you made a blended family and then became polyamorous. I mean, I think you guys were when you met, but yeah. they opened up to polyamory shortly after becoming a large blended family yep. um, just by chance. And they now are like one of the hubs of our local polyamorous community. They host monthly potlucks and like dozens of us and our children descend upon their house and they've got most of their children are like grown or growing out of their house but they recently decided to have one more kid so they've got now a two-year-old running around oh. at the same time yeah so it's their kids are 15 and up and then two that's where um, we would be right so now it, and it would be wild yeah <laughs> it's a very exciting time every time we're there and they are like the epitome of the village because everything at their house is sort of a crowdsourced. Well, we decided that we were going to put in a new shed. And so <laughs> Jim called two of the guys and we built this in the back. And right. Yeah, it really is. It's the it's um, it's a modern reinvention of, of principles that have been there that are as old as yeah. humanity. Yeah, I. Yeah. yeah. So when anybody's like calling feeling, everybody for a barn raising, right? Yeah. Well, anytime people are feeling a little weirded out or a little freaked out that this might be overwhelming for kids, we can we can remember that in fact, for most of humanity, kids in it, they existed inside of complicated communal environments, and the kids are fine. Yeah, the I mean, fine. the kids are fine according to every possible study, and like, look. I know we want a single family zoning, all of these things out of existence, but like separating out the number of adults who can be in a house and nimbying us out of nice neighborhoods aside, I don't think there's really any value to keeping a larger number of adults from caring for children. Right. What's the upside? I don't see it. I just don't see it. Yeah. It's well, like saying that someone is easy is a bad thing. Well, where's the value in being difficult? <laughs> you know, it's that kind of truism. <laughs> totally. Like, oh, well, Laura, this was really this was wonderful. Great. 
I so appreciate. I, I have I have more questions to ask. I think so we're going to have to have you back <laughs> because I, what, what happens is people ask questions about what about the kids all the time. And yeah. the thing that gets missed is that there are all these wonderful stories and upsides. So I would love to keep talking about this over time because there are so many yes. upsides. It's and it is so fascinating. And I really appreciate your wisdom. How can people find you? If they are looking for you, tell them how. Well, so the easiest way is my blog is at readyforpolyamory.com. And on the about page, there is a list of links to literally everything else. On most social media, I'm at ready for polyamory. And uh, if they want to find sort of the neat encapsulation of most of my thoughts, my book is coming out on audiobook. Uh, and so you can get it on Amazon in paperback, Kindle, or audiobook. And that's Ready for Polyamory, A Pragmatic Guide to Consensual Non-Monogamy. I love that. And I, I have to say, so I grabbed your book because there is, no matter how long you've been in this, the communal understanding and re-understanding of relationships, it, it's it's the only way. It's this, it's this beautiful cake we're all baking together. So thank you for doing your work mm -hmm. in the world. Yes. I'm so, so grateful. And you also offer coaching services, correct? I do. That's true. And you can find the link on the website awesome. at that about awesome. page that I mentioned. Awesome. So if people are looking for someone, there are lots of flavors out there. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful.